baby, Operation Sharky Special Ops. Oh yeah. What an album this is. Dragon Force. Inhuman Rampage. Now, I went and saw these guys play at the Galaxy up in like Orange County somewhere, 2006. And uh, Metal Jimmy, of course, was way into Dragon Force at the time. And I was on YouTube. Um, I wasn't really on Facebook yet. Everybody was, but I was like, what's that? You know, 2006, 2005, way back in the day. Um, YouTube was a new thing. And, um, you know, music started to suck about 1991 when record labels in Hollywood were signing up everything from Seattle and you know, just all this uh, stuff that they thought was American culture. I don't know. You know, they're liberal up in Hollywood and they're looking for liberal street people that will do their work down on the streets. And alternative bands are ready-made uh easy idiots for the cause or, you know, whatever you call them. Useful idiots. I think Michael Savage called them that. Or, you know, any liberal that uses a liberal um, and propagates or uh, proliferates or furthers, if you will, liberalism. And of course, now there were alternative bands long before that one band in 1991. I, I don't even want to say their name. But the Red Hot Chili Peppers and tons of these bands existed in the 80s. But the scene could not break through heavy metal. You know, Motley Crue and, and Guns N' Roses and Scorpions and all that. Uh, yeah, man. Heavy metal was an institution that dominated everything. Uh, from the time of Led Zeppelin one and, you know, Steppenwolf, even before that in 68 or the Beatles Helter Skelter in 68 or the who themselves, just in general, uh, the way the who were live or the Yardbirds, um, late sixties, early seventies, hard rock, boogie rock, you know, Southern rock like Skinner or, you know, just heavy hard rock in general. And of course, metal became permanent mainstays that you could not move. They were like these monolith monuments of cement that weighed a ton and you could not move them or budge them. You know, like Tommy Lee, Vince Neil, Cinderella, Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, Kiss, you know, it just in the 80s, it just took over. Now, of course, there was that scene on KROQ, K-Rock, uh, you know, where you had The Cure and, and all kinds of stuff and, and dance, you know, dance hall, ska and electronic uh, dance rock. And it kind of had a hero in David Bowie and things like that. But still, you guys, before late 1991, heavy metal, hard rocking music was the biggest thing in the music industry for a long time, going back to Led Zeppelin and before uh, in the late 60s. Uh, you could really say the mid 60s with the Yardbirds, you know, Jeff Beck. You could even say 1966, all that stuff, you know, the Standells, the Count Five and all that. Uh, and of course, the Who are always kind of swimming in and out of everything smashing their gear with their crazy uh, narcissist, nihilist anger, just their pointless rage. Uh, they definitely invented like everything on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the people at KROQ 
listening to modern rock and alternative rock and indie rock, they point to The Who just as much as heavy metal bands do. Uh, the Who are the glue, baby. They just are. Even maybe more so than The Beatles. But as the years went by, as time dragged on, of course, the early 90s would hit and that band uh, from Seattle got signed. And then all these other bands after them were just getting signed. And I, too, Clark the Shark from GE, the greenhouse effect in the whole year 1992, I was certain I was going to get signed to a major label because I'm like, oh, dude, it's ready made. Uh, it's cut out for me. I mean, but, uh, you know, the work is cut out for me, too, uh, for good, for bad, for better, or for worse. Uh, me and my band were some kind of leaders in Los Angeles for many years. I mean, we threw all these big shows uh, that had not just punk rock, but also metal and all these other kinds of bands playing, you know, Death and Taxes with Tom Shannon. Um, they're not heavy metal, punk or alternative or indie. I can't even put my finger on what they were. Uh, progressive, weird rock mixed with hard rock. I don't know. Weird. And I can say that about a lot of bands around the South Bay, Redondo Beach, Torrance, Los Angeles County. Believe you me, I shark would drive and go everywhere looking for bands to play my shows. Uh, always putting my band, the greenhouse effect, either in the middle of the bill or headlining at every show that I threw as everyone in the South Bay remembers. But uh, when alternative rock, you know, my music, indie, alternative, all the bands I was into, when it kind of suddenly got on the scene in late 91 and then just hardcore in 1992 and 93, uh, I found it odd that I, Clark the Shark, wasn't invited to the party. I wasn't getting a record deal which I or anything, like just nothing. And uh, in the year 1992, I was trying very hard. I was like mailing tapes, recording new songs. I was upping my game and going to another level. And you know me, Clark the Shark. I was a genius. And, and I still am, even though I'm pretty old at 59 now today. But way back in 92, I was getting frustrated. And then I would say June, July, August the summer of 92, I officially quit music, you guys, or something like there was a day I remember uh, I mailed this letter back east to that guy, uh, Jeff Snow, who was, you know, kind of helping me with GE greenhouse effect. And I just told him, man, I'm tired, dude, it's over. I can't, you know, <laughs> I just I'm mentally tired. I went on in the studio recording by myself. I mean, Rick Carmody, you know, the red haired guy, he was gone uh, in pretty much for the whole year, 1992. I mean, he played the gig in February, 92 in Manhattan beach at the reactor, but I'm not sure if we ever played again. I think we did. We might have sporadically, uh, till the end of 1992, but, um, I kept on recording songs, you know, She's a Bitch was recorded in, you know, later uh, 1992, like I think August of 92, five years, Addicted, It Ain't Easy, a bunch of songs. Brandy was recorded in 1991. Uh, right after I heard that band from Seattle, I was like, shit, three piece band, you know, I went and recorded Brandy as kind of a, you know, reaction or a chess move. Like, there's your move. Here's my move. I'm going to get signed. Don't worry. I'll pass you by, dude. And I didn't get signed. And uh, 1991, 1992, and then uh, 
you know, I tried to keep the band going, you guys. I, I was jamming with all kinds of people. But without red-haired Rick Carmody, you know, Ted, the guy with the big bun of red hair, uh, he really was like the glue in the band, the three-piece band. Uh, I had moved to guitar and there was Ted, but then we were always going through different drummers, as many three-piece band bands do. Uh, you have to find that guy that he, he likes to be in the band. He's And then he's also a good or great drummer. And something happened to GE in 1992 where it just faded away and fizzled out. And it was over. And for the rest of the 90s, I spent that decade sitting around and watching alternative bands uh, all over MTV, all over the place, all over the radio at K-Rock. And there was nothing I could do about it. I was just sitting there hopeless and helpless. I mean, there were times in the 90s where I tried to make comebacks or, you know, flirted with, hey, dude, you know, a bass player, you know, a drummer, you know, let's let's jam, you know, that thing. And we never could do it. And I, and I would always say, you know, me, Clark the Shark, I was born for a record deal, not, you know, and not an indie label. I was born to be on a major label. And I was saying this way back in the 80s, in 1987, when I was 22, 1988, when I was 23, uh, you know, jamming with Phil Keegan and, and Ted, Rick Carmody, the greenhouse effect. I was always like, I don't want to be on an indie. I don't want to be on SST or Sub Pop or Twin Tone. You know, I'll mail my tapes to those labels, but I want to be on Geffen. I want to be on Capital EMI. I mean, I was saying this when I was 21 in 1986, when it was unheard of to say this because I wasn't heavy metal and I wasn't really K-Rock, you know, like The Cure or any of that either, you know, or Dave Wakeling or, you know, nothing like that, you know, Kaja Goo Goo or whatever that sound was in the 80s. I had this sound that I got from The Who where they smashed their gear and I tore holes in speakers downstairs at 251 Paseo de Gracia to record a highly distorted guitar sound uh, with my vocals and, you know, and I made the mistake of mailing my tapes around and I was going, hey, you guys, I got this new thing. I call it grunge rock. And the reason I said grunge is because of Neil Young. Uh, he was known as the word grunge, you know, for those live albums and pretty much his whole overall thing, his persona, the way he wore flannel and he wasn't really heavy metal or uh, traditional hard rock or like Skinner or, you know, he wasn't anything like that. And he, Neil Young was like the inventor of this whole new revolution that was totally different. From anything, you guys, and me, Clark the Shark, I stepped up and took notice of Neil Young way back in the day. And, um, you know, uh, come the 80s, when I'm 18 in 1983, uh, you know, I would sit down with Ted, who was fastly becoming my good buddy down at El Retiro Park in Torrance, and I was showing him my demos. And I'll never forget, he was like, why is the guitar so distorted? And I was like, oh, because, you know, like Neil Young, dude, it's like Crazy Horse and all that. We're going to be a power band. And he was like, dude, you mean like heavy metal? Big deal. I'm like, no, not heavy metal. I've got this whole new idea, this thing. You know, when people around the South Bay, Redondo and Torrance were like, well, Shark, you know, it's been done before. The Minutemen, Husker Du, you know, Black Flag and many other punk bands. And I was like, no, no, you guys, I'm going to mix it with dance and pop. You know, it's going to be on the radio. It's, it's going to be this kick ass new thing. I was saying this, you guys, probably from 1981 when I was 16 at South High all the way until 1991 and I was very committed to this whatever it was you know when people were like shark you know there's already the Jesus and Mary chain and and I was like no you guys this is different I've got 
this thing. I can't put my finger on what this is. And when I first played with Phil Keegan, uh, you know, Phil Keegan is a guy I knew from second grade at Parkway School or even before that at first grade in 1971, 72, me and Phil Keegan were buddies from way back. And then we kind of lost touch for a long time. And he went and learned guitar and I went and, you know, played everything and drums. And then we got back together about 1986 or so or 87 at Rick Carmody's house down by the library at El Retiro Park, you know, Vista del Parque, whatever it's called down there. They lived at, uh, I think, 136 Vista del Parque, right by the park and the library. And Ted's room became like the rehearsal studio. Uh, they jammed there long before me with another drummer, a guy named Rich Eben, who was an incredible drummer. But um, me, Clark the Shark, I guess I was just biding my time and waiting or something. I wanted to jam with that project and I actually wanted to be the singer. And I think I even came and sang with them a few times. I can't remember. But, um, you know, me, I got to play an instrument and I secretly, you know, wanted to play drums or or something with an instrument in my hands. And, um, you know, long story short, eventually the guy Rich quit that band and then Phil and Ted said, hey, Clark the Shark, you know, you want to jam? And I was like, fuck, yeah. This was 1986 or 87. I was 21 or 22. And the rest is history, baby. Uh, we just started playing. And, um, you know, we had a sound that was all our own. It was indie, punk, metal, garage, underground garage, psychedelia, 1966, meets 80s, 90s, ahead of its time, you name it, baby. It was the Greenhouse Effect three-piece, GE, a little bit James Gang, a little bit The Who, a little bit Neil Young, David Bowie, Triumph, uh, you name it, dude, Black Flag, The Minutemen. It was all in there, Husker Du, you name it. It was all in there because all of this music, I was into everything. And I put it all in my band, GE, The Greenhouse Effect. Uh, but as the years would go by, you know, uh, the thing with Phil Keegan, uh, we went separate ways, September 1990. And then weirdly, very strange, the next thing I knew, I, Clark the Shark, in my Fender Stratocaster, I was the guitarist, no longer the drummer. And me and Ted had formed the ultimate three-piece. Uh, we, we didn't quite do it yet. It was just a two-piece. It was me and Ted for the longest time because we were in the studio recording an album, a new Greenhouse Effect album without Phil Keegan. A total blasphemy, sacrilege, because the guy was an amazing guitarist and leader, uh, co-leader of the band with me. Uh, and it was a sacrilege, blasphemy to not be playing with Phil Keegan because the guy is such a legend. But for better or for worse, we... Um, we made the album going legit all by ourselves, me and Ted, a two piece, sort of like Genesis. We were in the studio and I was overdubbing my parts while Ted played the bass. And of course, we wrote Ben is Dead, Star, Hey Negrita, 22nd Street, America the Beautiful, God's Joke. Uh, what an album, Wilson Phillips, amazing, 1991 you know, got into Flipside and all these magazines with reviews. Little side note, before I was in GE, the greenhouse effect in the South Bay, Redondo Beach, Torrance, I jammed with a guy named Steve-O Stepanian, and we formed the Soul Clinic way, way back in 1984, 85. And I'm going to be per perfectly truthful here. Soul Clinic was probably a better band, just a kick-ass three-piece with me, Steve, pa Steve Stepanian, and Ted. Uh, it just had an amazing original sound, very heavy like The Who. 
and that bassist Dave Basin would come and play with me and Steve after Ted would leave us and go jam with Phil Keegan. Uh, but eventually me and Steve-O would go different directions. He moved up to Grass Valley, California, and I became the drummer with Ted and Phil Flipper Keegan in the greenhouse effect, first called Vanna Black in 1986. I'm not kidding you guys. This gets weirder and weirder as I tell this story that many in the South Bay know all too well. But as years went by, you know, Flipper's gone and now it's me and Ted. We're doing Going Legit, you know, early 1991. And it seems like GE, the Greenhouse Effect, is suddenly not just the biggest band in L.A. or something, you know, at least of the bands that aren't signed. We're just playing all these shows. And it's incredible because we're playing with punk bands and all these different kinds of bands. And I didn't even think we were as good as those other bands. But it seems like thousands of people or just lots of people were coming to the shows just to see me, yours truly, your humble servant, Clark the Shark, uh, and my band, The Greenhouse Effect. And it was amazing, you guys. Uh, it was growing and growing and building and building. And of course, I kept mailing my tapes into record labels and we kept taking pictures and filming videos. You know, many of those videos and pictures that you see today on the internet, you guys. But um, another band hit it big in late 1991. Uh, another band that did not feature me, Clark the Shark, in it. And of course, they went to rock and roll heaven and got huge. But the story doesn't end there. All these coattails writers bands came along in 1992 and 1993 and so on. And still no record deal or label for Clark the Shark. Uh, funny enough, weirdly. Long story short, I was very bitter, you guys, uh, bitter at everything. And, uh, you know, time went on and I began to say things like I fucking hate alternative rock, indie, all of it. And it's funny because that was my music, me, Clark the Shark. But when that music got big and, and you know, it went and had a big party they forgot to invite me, Clark the Shark. Try as I may, I couldn't get in the door. And, uh, you know, just like Paul McCartney that one night where they wouldn't let him in, you know, when he had to get back in his limo or SUV, uh, that was me, Clark the Shark. And then people acted like, no, oh, ho hum, it's no big deal. He never existed anyway. But then that's when I formed the shark tricks not the matrix i formed the simulation that i call the sharkulation and i began to be like talking tina and you better be nice to shark and as years went by i began to support like uh heavy metal a blasphemy sacrilege in 2003 many 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 years later that band called the darkness with justin hawkins in england they hit the scene and when i saw that i supported it i was like yeah baby the good old days here it comes rock and roll is gonna come back but when i saw this band dragon force and I heard them on YouTube way back in the day. I knew I had to see this cheesy, lame, horrible heavy metal band who plays fast and technical and with a ton of power. And uh, even though I think this is fucking awful music, I love it because it goes against everything 90s. It goes against everything uh, from today, so-called. And this band has had a lot of lineup changes. The guy named ZP Thart, the cheesy, you know, metal singer, he left the band and then they got another guy that's similar to him, you know, as heavy metal bands do. And it's so funny, you know how metal bands always have lineup changes and people come and go. Well, Dragon Force was and still is no exception, you guys. 
uh, now I've lost track of these guys over the years, but during the era of Inhuman Rampage, I went and saw these guys not once, but I think three times uh, when ZP Thart was still in the band on vocals. And I supported them then. And over the years, you know, when I heard ZP left, uh, you know, come on, I couldn't get as into it. And then, of course, this drummer, uh, you know, left. Yeah, that was a real bummer, you know, Through the Fire and the Flames. Incredible song, you guys. This whole album's incredibly fast, technical, difficult. It's prog rock. It's, uh, I think, mainly all in 4-4, but it, it reminds me of, like, if you took Kansas or, like, Sticks and you put them on 45 or, like, Triumph. <laughs> It's like cheesy heavy metal, you know, power metal, Euro metal, but sped up like you're on speed or coke or like, I don't know, acid or some shit. It's really fast, really loud, really angry and powerful. You know, it's cheesy. It's fucking lame. It's fucking gay and retarded. But I love it, you guys. Dragon Force, the phase and era of Inhuman Rampage. I went and saw these guys, and then on the next album after this, they're still kicking ass or something. Um, Dave McIntosh, when he was in the band, awesome. They got a new drummer now who's awesome too, very fast, very technical. And of course, Sam Totman and Herman Lee, the uh, two twin lead guitarists, you know, playing harmony, very fast technical leads. They're incredible, you guys. It sounds like a video game or something. It's just, you know, and you get sick of it, hearing it over and over and over fast. But it's interesting or something. It has a lot of power, a lot of energy. Uh, I really like the guy, Fred LeClerc, the bassist. When I went to a Dragon Force gig, I think it was 2008. I uh, can't remember. 2007, I actually hung out with these guys at their tour bus and it was just funny hanging out with them and they told me that they love the who i'll never forget that it was their favorite band <laughs> and i was like what you guys and then they were like yeah and I, like the guy Her herman lee was like you love them quadrophenia you know and i was like wow that's fucking cool you guys and uh, I remember, like, the guy, Sam Totman like, threw a beer at me. And he's like, why wouldn't we like the Who? You know, piss off. You know, they spoke in these British accents. It was awesome, you guys. They're a real cheesy metal band from England, like Iron Maiden. But I, you know, I got to support it. And, uh, you know, after what happened with me, Clark the Shark, with grunge and indie and alternative in the 90s, I started supporting all these metal bands in the 2000s, you know, like The Darkness and Dragon Force and Airborne and, and many others, you guys. Not really because I like them, but because I'll support anything that isn't alternative. Right here on the Clark the Shark show, because it wouldn't invite me to the party. And I'm very fucking bitter about it. But it's all a sharkulation. Who knows? Maybe I wrote it all just to torture myself. I probably did, you guys. Yeah, you know I did. I write everything. I created it. I created you. And I created Dragon Force. And who knows? I probably recorded and overdubbed every one of these instruments here. And I did it just to make an album that would annoy me, myself, yours truly, your humble serv servant, Clark the Shark from the Golden EIB Sharkerphone. It's not a microphone, baby. It's a Sharkerphone. Because when I'm talking about Dragon Force, Inhuman Rampage, you know, 19, 2005, 2006, it's not the 19s, you guys. This is in the modern era, the 2000s. I rarely review music from today, but sometimes I do. And I got to review Dragon Force, you guys. I do. Right here on the Clark the Shark show. I want you to buy this album. And even if ZP Thart and Dave McIntosh are no longer in the band or Fred LeClerc, I still want you to support the band. There was this keyboard guy, too. Uh, Vadim or Vadam or something, dude, he was uh, important. His cheesy, like Bon Jovi sounding keyboards were very important to the sound of this band, you guys. 
It was fucking funny. It was rad. I mean, these guys know they're cheesy and they're, they're just funny. Uh, like guys that wear glasses, you know, with eyeballs popping out, you know, with a sense of humor. I don't know if Sam Topman has a sense of humor, but they all did and they all do. But they have internal problems, you know, as all heavy metal bands do. They're always trying to look for that sound and get that perfect sound right. Unfortunately or fortunately, who knows? Right here on the Clark the Shark Show, 1-800-449-8255 from the shark Alama Ding Dong, the shark a doodle doo baby. And you just got the only review of Dragon Force in Human Rampage that you will ever need or you will ever want. Right here from Sharky, baby. Buy this music. And even support this band today with the new members and... I don't really care. I've seen their videos from now. They're still really good. To me, it's not Dragon Force. It's not the same guys, but it still kicks ass. You know, it's interesting. You know, it's not serious music that you're going to put in your uh, vinyl collection, or maybe it is, you know, to some people, or maybe even me, Clark the Shark, because it plays a role and it does a purpose. It serves a meaning. Dragon Force and Human Rampage. 2005, they toured. 2006, and I saw them at the Galaxy up in Orange County, and what a show it was. I had to go see them again. I think it was on the Uproar Tour uh, 2008, you know, the one that uh, Roadrunner Records does with all those lame, like, uh, grovelly metal band or new metal bands dragon force was the band dude that stole the show at that tour believe me these guys should be a lot bigger today and i think they would be if they still had zp and fred and dave mcintosh in the band i do believe that but they don't got them you guys sadly oh well Buy this album, you guys. You heard it right here from the Golden EIB Sharkophone, not a microphone from Clark the Shark. And I'm out of here, people. Peace.